So on board the ISS, we have a number of resources that are required to, to keep it to keep it and the humans on board uh, alive and healthy and fully functioning. And we had a plan for for how to resupply these logistics. And it's things like oxygen, um, perhaps carbon dioxide removal, uh, water, uh, w- you know, waste collection and, and removal, uh, shirts, T-shirts. Uh, and then it's, of course, the utilization, all those things. We couldn't launch with with say, 15 years' worth of those things on board, our plan always was to launch them and to remove trash along the way. And so uh, that obviously was affected prior to shuttle, but when we're flying shuttles normally, now all of a sudden we're going to retire shuttles. Now how does that, how does that change? And so we had, we had this idea of skip cycle uh, from the very beginning of the program. We knew that the shuttle... Uh, could delay. We knew that the shuttle, because of weather and mechanical issues, it might not fly on this date. It might fly 30 days later. Well, the same would be true for uh, for uncrewed vehicles, in particular the, the Progress vehicles the Russians were going to fly. They might uh, either be delayed or might one of those might not be successful. So we wanted to have enough reserves on board ISS to protect for those cases. And so we actively managed it. We established a requirement. And in fact, we argued about was that the requirement, right requirement or should be more or less, and we've evolved that over time. Now, all of a sudden, shuttle retires. We have new resupply vehicles that are coming online, both from uh, the European Space Agency and the Japanese Space Agency, but they, uh, at the time, had only flown one time, and we weren't very confident in their ability. Plus, we had signed these contracts with commercial entities to fly vehicles. At a certain date, they were actually doing the design of the vehicle, so we thought it likely that they wouldn't meet those dates. And then when they do, can they fly as often as we, uh, we expect them to? So we actually... <clears throat> as we neared retirement, we actually changed our philosophy for that transition period. We actually decided to fly, and in fact, the last shuttle flight was to go bring up a tremendous amount of extra spare parts and extra supply, food, water, and so on, so that we were in a position to allow those other flights to uh, to change. So we, if, in, in a more concrete fashion, we had a skip cycle requirement that was here. Now shuttles are going to retire. We're going to rely on these new vehicles. We actually go up to a much higher reserve that's required on board ISS to allow us some margin for the, the, the schedule to slip for these new guys. And as we become confident in this supply chain, then we'll bring that back down. And so uh, the lesson there is, again, you have to think for uh, what resources you need on board in terms of reserve and what your spares, uh, you know, what, what uh, uh, additional capability you need to have. Uh, and know that that might change over time. One, you want to be most efficient as you can, but also know that the, the, the external environment might change and, and have to change it. Uh, I'll tell you the one thing that we learned through all this, uh, we were so focused at the beginning of the programs, we were assembling and, and, and moving forward. We were very focused on having enough food and water. And, and, and in fact, there are times in the program when both of those were extremely critical. Oxygen. We almost you know, had times where we were almost to the red line on all these these things. And so we were so struggling with those things. What we were not worried about at all turned out to be probably our biggest problem was trash. So as you bring cargo up, you fill these vehicles, the shuttle and now our cargo resupply vehicles, very efficiently. You have a, you know dozens of people here on the ground who are packing these bags, and they're very efficient how they put the devices and all the, the packing material in a bag, and we fly it. Well, now it goes up up to orbit, and now we have to repack those bags. And so we found that the bags, even though the same size volume coming down, carries significantly less mass than it did going up. So if you always fly your supply vehicle up full, over time the space station will get more and more full, more full and more full, and eventually it will fill up where you can't even uh, operate anymore. And so we found that, that actually trash removal, having a vehicle on board station to throw those tra- throw, throw trash away, and in some cases launching a vehicle not completely volumetrically full so that we could bring down additional volume of trash was extremely important. And so now going forward, I, I would tell you that uh, it's important for future programs to, to think through all the resources that you need. Uh, and, and that's in, you know consumables, but as well as well as spare parts. Don't carry any more than you need, but make sure you have enough. Uh, that's pretty simple. But the big thing is think about the other side of the equation: getting things off. So even in exploration, there are going to be things on board the vehicle that you'll want to get away from you. You don't want to have waste 
uh, on board I, uh, on board your vehicle forever. Uh, things just like the food containers, you're going to want to throw away uh, and, and get away. So you have to actively manage what you're going to do with your trash, having adequate stowage volume for your trash, and a way to get it away from the vehicle. So even if you're talking about a vehicle that's going one way, a long way, you know, out beyond the moon, uh, you're going to want to have a way to throw away trash and get it off the vehicle, outside, and, and away, from the, uh, away from the human. So uh, a big lesson, I think, that we learned along the way.